Welcome to wolf country. There are wolves all around here and wolves over the mountain in Yellowstone National Park where I work, where I've worked the last 25 years. I've actually studied wolves my entire life. And often I ask myself, why did I do this? Is there any value in this at all for the world, for people, for wolves? Or is this just something for me to do during my life? Well, this story takes me back to my youth and connects me with all of nature. And I think that's an important story to share now because of the position we're with and our relationship to nature. So I wanna share with you a little bit how I became interested in wolves and what happened and where I think we sit today. And that's where I'm gonna start. For a few months ago, I attended a conference here in Big Sky, Montana about the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. This conference is sponsored every other year by Yellowstone National Park. The first talk of the conference was on economics. I do not wish to take issue with that. It was an excellent talk. The talk was about does public land pay? Or does having public land nearby to a community create jobs, growth, and money? We already know that it attracts people. Not one thing was said about the value of land to itself. Or does land have intrinsic value, not determined by people? The word conservation was used, but that's as close as it got. And the definition was implied to mean wise use or using the land for something people could use. You might say the talk was about the commodification of nature. Are wolves something that we can commodify? This is not how I grew up. I thought all land had intrinsic value. I thought nature was bigger than me. And this was a romantic attitude that I held and only now do I realize back then how romantic a notion it was and how odd this worldview was at the time. I look back longingly when I thought like this, was even taught to think like this. And you will soon see why I feel this nostalgia. But more on that in a minute. The first thing I want to do, though, is talk about what do wolves do for us? Originally, we said not much, and we tried to kill them off, as shown here. Wolves killed, frozen, and stacked like cordwood. For many, this is still the solution. I want you to think about what wolves represent. How do we think about them? This may help lead to some practical solutions with the problem animal, but I want you to set that aside for now. I was brought up on a camp in Northeastern Ohio. This is not cool. Had this camp been in Alaska or even Montana, that would have been cool. <laughs> but I am stuck with Ohio. But at that camp were forests, and I looked deep into those trees, and I thought those trees were bigger than me, that they didn't exist because of me, and that they controlled the world. Whether any of this is true or not, we can debate. But to a young boy at the time, I found who I was looking into those trees. We have lost this, or maybe we have never had it. This is the position of the wolf. We have looked into their eyes, and we have found mystery and wildness, but we have struggled to find meaning in that relationship. So we controlled them, we killed them, 
Never have we let them be, and now we never can. Oddly, they have expanded their range in Eurasia and North America, despite this negative viewpoint. But the wolf now is not of the world of my youth. Wild, untamed, not part of us. And to further bring this message home to you, I have a quote from a somewhat famous book written about Montana in 1947 by Alfred Guthrie called The Big Sky. And the book was actually set in Montana in the 1820s. And this is Uncle Zeb talking to the main character, Boone Caudill. Quote, 10 year too late, she's gone. The whole shittery, gone by God and not to care, saving some of us who see her new. This was man's country once. Every water full of beaver and a galore of buffler, anyways a man looked and no cramping and no crowding for Christ's sake, unquote. What we have now might be called semi-wild. I can't help but think that it's a little tainted. Wolves at the pleasure of humans. Is that how we want to live in this world? My dad's camp led me to wolves. That may seem odd because there were no wolves in Ohio. They were long gone. But I learned the skill of canoeing at my father's camp, and I took that skill to wolf country, the north woods of the upper lake states, and when I went there, I learned that many people hated wolves. I took my canoeing skills to the far north, and Alaska, and I learned there too that more people hated wolves. I was naive, so I found this appalling. It was appalling to me because one time when I was young, I was hiking in the woods with my father at our camp, and we came upon a deer. My father had no biological training of any kind, and in fact, because of circumstances, he was not able to go to college. So you might say that he was uneducated on these things. As we stood and looked at the deer, he turned to me and said, how could anybody shoot something so beautiful? My father died and I went off to college and I majored in wildlife biology and I learned about shooting more deer and other big game. I don't know what my life's tally of dead deer is, 40 to 50, add to that seven elk. My wife, Christine, is here in the audience tonight and we hunt together and we taught our young boys, Sawyer and Hawk, how to hunt too. Is the value of elk and deer so my family can shoot them? Is the value of public land to create jobs, growth, and money? This is where the wolf sits. Wildness waiting for people to give them meaning. And to have them, we must shoot them. Because I've studied wolves my entire life, I can reflect back. And in the early years of my profession, research questions were dominated by interesting questions about wolves. Now, research questions are dominated by how do we live with wolves in a human-dominated world? I wonder what my dad would have said had we seen a wolf in those woods that day. I wonder what my dad would say if he knew I supported wolf hunting. I imagine him saying to me, 
Why did I buy an old farm to turn into a camp for children? I know he did that to teach children to love nature, yet I shoot deer and elk and I support wolf hunting. That is contradictory and love of nature is what defines me as a human being. What did those woods in Ohio do to me and wolves after? What did they teach me? What can they teach you? Usually when I talk like this, I will get a talking to from somebody in the audience afterward. This has happened before. <laughs> Questioning hunting is heretical to wildlife management. It is so foundational to the profession. But I think the discussion needs to start here. What are wolves worth to themselves, then to nature, and then to us last? This is the main point of my talk. Because if we view wolves that way, an animal we've struggled with, our entire relationship with them, but if we think of it that way, we will have more humility in our approach to nature, that we don't control it, and that we don't have to manage it to death, that we can leave some parts of it wild to look into and set our life on. Some would call humans the apex of creation. I think a healthier way to view it is humans as one part of creation. So, I have no idea how social change comes about, what we call cultural norms. But as best I can figure, it's an idea, usually pushed by one person, that creates a crack in social norms and human attitudes, and then a fissure grows through it. The idea I'm asking you to think about, about nature, about wolves, is nature not all for us. And true nature has wolves, especially in this country. Not just a resource to manage. And it's more than just economics, which was left out of the talk that I started referring to. This is where Yellowstone comes in as an example, where I work as a wildlife biologist. World's first national park, established 1872. Predator control right out of the gate was the policy. The last wolf was killed in 1926. It was a wolfless landscape from 1926 to the mid-1990s when we restored them, bringing them back. Not like Uncle Zeb was referring to when he talked to his nephew about what Montana used to be like, but still stopping the tidal wave of human takeover which wolves have paid dearly for because we tried to kill them all off. I think this symbolism has value for us emotionally and spiritually in our relation to nature, especially with wolves, which has been so hard for us to deal with. So, preserving is not all about economics but I wanna share with you one last story and it will seem to stray a bit from wolves. But I'm hoping you're seeing my message here is the hard parts of nature weave around and come back to, to love all of nature. This last summer, my family and I did a canoe trip in the Northern Yukon Territory down a stunningly clear river with emerald trenches of clear water through mountains. Remote, maybe not pristine like it was, like Uncle Zeb was talking about, but pretty doggone wild. And every gravel bar we stopped on had a plethora of rocks that were hard not to look at. 
And all these rocks are different sizes and shapes, polished differently by the river, different colors. Of course, we brought back some of those rocks. Here's one. I keep it on the windowsill in my office where I work in Yellowstone National Park. And quite often, I hold it in my hand just on a normal working day. Oh, there haven't been many of those lately. Um, (laughs) And I reach for it when I'm on the telephone to the windowsill where I keep it. And I hold it in my hand like this. And I think about where that rock was all that time. And I think about how it got that smooth. And I think about how long was it there? What stories does that rock have to tell? Did a wolf walk by with no people around? And I get a calm, easy feeling like that because I feel connected with nature that is not ruled and controlled by people. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I want you to think about. Thank you.